So this is the 2020 iPhone SE, Apple's newest budget phone. Now, this was a phone expected by a lot of people, with speculation about everything from the name to the body style. And what we got was a phone that looks on the surface to be a modernized iPhone 8. However, I think it's a little more than that. And after using it for a week, I've formed some pretty conclusive opinions. So should you buy the iPhone SE 2020? Let's find out. First of all, let's take a look at what we get in the box. Well, it's an iPhone, so you're gonna be getting the usual stuff. Obviously, you get the iPhone as well as a charging cable and plug, some headphones and some documentation. It's all well put together, properly protected, and makes for a generally really nice unboxing experience. Something that I rarely get, because most of the time I actually buy my phones refurbished. So yeah, I'd say this is like unboxing any other iPhone. After this, we got specs, and this is where this phone starts to get really interesting. The iPhone SE features the Apple A13 Bionic processor, which was actually one of my favorite parts of the iPhone 11 when I checked that out. This processor is what got me really interested in this phone. And we're going to be talking more about what that processor means later on. We also see three gigabytes of RAM, so one gigabyte less than the iPhone 11 and 11 Pro. Storage options of 64, 128, and 256 gigabytes, which is a nice range. Now, me personally, I have the 64 gigabyte variant because as I said before, I don't keep a lot of stuff on my phone. That said, it is always nice to know the options there. The iPhone SE weighs in at 148 grams, so exactly the same as it was on the iPhone 8, which would make sense as they do look very similar. Finally, there are three color options being black, white, and red, all of which look nice and rich. And while well, I personally got the black one, mainly because it was the easiest to get hold of, I personally think all of them look really nice. As I said in my initial impressions video though, I do kind of wish there were some more funky color options or even the gold variant like we saw on the iPhone 8. Still, in my opinion, not a deal breaker. And overall, I think the specs are pretty good for the price here. As for the specs, that's pretty much it. That doesn't include the screen that gets its own section later, but I personally don't like to focus on benchmarks for my reviews. I think user experience is a much better test, and we are going to be talking about how this phone performs later on. Following on, we have build quality, and despite Apple making a few measures here to drive down the cost of this phone, it still feels nice and premium. The glass and aluminium build feel great in the hand, and despite what I've said about glass phones being significantly more breakable than aluminium phones, which is still true if you're prone to dropping your phone like me, then you probably should still get a case. However, because of the size, I don't think I'd be likely to drop this phone, which is a huge plus. That said, the sensible thing to do in this situation would be to accept the risk of a glass back, and of course, make sure you have a case on it. Still, there's something magical about not having a case though. In terms of water resistance, this seems to be an area where Apple have cut back, only including an IP67 resistance, whereas on the 11 series, we did see an IP68 rating. What this means is the iPhone SE is rated to survive in up to a meter of water for half an hour. While this does seem to be a cutback, and don't get me wrong, it is a cutback. I've been totally fine with the IP67 rating on my iPhone 10 for like the longest time. It's without a doubt saved my phone a few times. And so in my opinion, it's not a deal breaker, but it is just something you should be aware of. Overall, the iPhone SE feels like, well, an iPhone. Nice and premium, but probably should be used in a case. I definitely should get a case. Moving on, we have the screen, and the iPhone SE certainly saw the return to a classic design. It has a not so stunning resolution of 750 by 1334, it has a PPI of 326, and a peak brightness of 625 nits, so on paper, not all that impressive. However, because of the 4.7 inch screen, I haven't particularly noticed the low resolution. And well, I probably could if I got like super close, and my usual distance in my real world usage, I'm going to be honest, I don't really notice. The SE screen also features haptic touch, which allows for different actions such as opening up menus. This is different to the old 3D touch system, which is actually based on pressure, which I actually still prefer. That said, I've got used to haptic touch now, and I like the extra interactivity level that you get with your phone. So in my opinion, it's nice they included it. Another thing they included that I like a lot is the true tone, which makes sure your phone's color temperature is accurate to your current lighting. I love this feature. I've said before how I think it's kind of like auto white balance. And it's just one of those features that doesn't seem all that significant on paper, but when you get used to it, impossible to go back from. So overall, what do I think of this screen? Let's be honest, this isn't gonna be winning any awards for the best phone screen anytime soon. That said, despite using the high-res HDR OLED screen for my iPhone 10 for a really long time now, the biggest thing I missed was the aspect ratio. As for the rest, I got used to it pretty quickly. And while I do obviously still prefer the newer screens, the SE screen's 
certainly isn't unusable. Next up, we have usually a really strong point on the iPhone side of things, button placement. And I'm pleased to say on the iPhone SE, it's pretty much as good as ever. As I said in my iPhone 8 review, there are two separate volume up and volume down buttons for easy distinguishability, a lock button isolated on the side of the phone, which is actually super important, the ever useful mute switch, and the home button, which we're actually going to be talking about more next. As for now, all the buttons feel nice and tactile, they're all logically mapped with the hold for power off returning, and due to the return of the home button, no accidental screenshots when you're squeezing your phone. Now, there isn't a headphone jack like a few people actually speculated would be returning, but honestly, at this point, I don't really think that's to be expected. As we saw in the unboxing, Apple did include some lightning headphones, and with wireless headphones and adapters being as accessible as they are, to me, this really isn't a big deal. Overall, I think the iPhone SE has brought along the most mature, refined version of, in my opinion, the best button layout we've seen from Apple yet. And as everything feels so high quality for, again, a budget iPhone, I really don't have any complaints here. Next up, as I said before, we got the home button and, of course, Touch ID. The iPhone SE 2020 actually brought back that haptic home button like we saw from the iPhone 7 to the iPhone 8 instead of having no home button and face ID like we've seen on iPhones over the past few years. Now, this, along with the screen and the camera, is probably one of the biggest cost-cutting measures that came along with this phone. And after using it for the past week, I'm honestly okay with that. Returning to this much more simple method of navigation has actually been pretty nice. I love the fact that this means less of those button combinations that we saw introduced on the iPhone 10, and it can make operating the phone one-handed a lot easier. In terms of Touch ID, in my opinion, this is the best yet. It's very fast, very accurate, and all in all, works great. After this, we have the camera. Now, I actually did do a full test on this the other day. If you want to check that out, it'll be up there probably, but it's mostly pros along with some pretty significant limitations. First off, there is one 12 megapixel main camera with an aperture of f1.8, and while this is limited compared to the two or three cameras that are now on iPhones these days, the important thing here is that this isn't a photo enthusiast iPhone. Most people don't need a second focal length. It also makes my job reviewing this camera a hell of a lot easier. The front-facing camera has also taken a hit in terms of specs, being dropped down from 12 megapixels like we saw on the iPhone 11 line, back down to 7 megapixels. Megapixels. It also took some pretty significant cuts in terms of video, and we're gonna discuss those in a moment. The app is overall good with easy changing of things like aspect ratio, and of course, accessing that aperture slider in portrait mode. However, I really don't like the hold for video. I take a lot of burst photos, so I do naturally go to hold down the shutter button. Yeah. That's something I'm still getting used to. In terms of overall image quality, I've actually found it to be quite good. Sharpness was great, although not quite at the level of the iPhone 11. That said, as I mentioned in my detailed camera review, I think this is probably down to a hardware element of the iPhone 11. Dynamic range was fantastic, and I found the color science to be pretty much on point, with a nice amount of contrast and saturation, great looking skin tones, and all in all, it just looks really good. I was expecting this to be like the iPhone 8, but no, totally different league. There is also a good amount of room for post-processing, which I always love. As I've said before, Lightroom Mobile is a great tool, and as long as your source photo can hold up to some editing, a little bit of post-processing makes your photos look significantly better. When it comes to low-light photography, unfortunately, we don't see night mode here, so stock low-light is pretty mediocre. However, due to popular requests, I decided to chuck neural cam on this thing and see how it worked. If you don't know what neural cam is, it's essentially a low-light photography app, and looking at these side-by-side, -side, I got some pretty comparable results to the iPhone 11. 11, which, in my opinion, is super impressive. In the past, when I've tested neural cam against night mode, it's been good, but pretty obvious which is which. And as I test in more and more situations, this may end up being the case again. However, it certainly isn't bad. The iPhone SE also features portrait mode on both cameras. However, Apple decided to pretty severely limit it. It now only works on human faces, which, in my opinion, sucks. I use portrait mode on my 10 for so much more than taking photos of people. In fact, I barely ever took photos of people with it. Most of the time, it was just to get that fake background blur. And while it does work well in its use case, it kind of sucks it was limited this way. Moving on to video, again, I was actually pretty impressed with the results coming at the main camera. It can shoot 4K at up to 60 FPS with extended dynamic range at up to 30 FPS. And my personal favorite frame rate, 24 frames per second. I love how they kept the feature where you can tap to change frame rates 
it's because sometimes if I want some cinematic goodness, I am going to flip it into 4K 60 FPS. However, most of the time I'm going to be shooting in 24 FPS. So yeah, being able to switch that on tap, amazing. In terms of slow motion, you can shoot full HD in either 120 or 240 FPS, which again, has that same tap to cycle frame rate feature. Honestly, the 240 FPS doesn't look great, but the 120 FPS isn't actually that bad. Don't get me wrong, it still does look like phone slow motion, but not as phone slow motion-y. Slow motion-y. That is not a word but we're gonna go with it. I'd say the biggest downfall of the video performance would have to come with the front-facing camera. As with the megapixel downgrade, also came the loss of the 120 FPS slow fees, which to be honest, not a huge deal, but also gone is the 4K recording, which honestly is a little bit of a shame. That said, if you want the highest quality recording, you really should be shooting on the main camera anyway, so not too much of a loss in my opinion. Overall, initially, I thought I wasn't gonna like the camera performance. I thought the single focal length would be limiting, and the lack of night mode and a fully functioning portrait mode would suck. And while I still do hold these complaints, this is not a phone for camera nerds like me. The iPhone SE is a phone first, camera second. And in that regard, I was way more impressed than I thought it was gonna be. Following this, we have perhaps the most important aspect of any phone, OS and app performance. The iPhone SE shipped with iOS 13, and while it hasn't been without issues, such as haptic touch not working with notifications, these issues will almost definitely be fixed in coming updates. Scrolling through the phone feels smooth, I haven't had any issues with crashing, and yeah, overall, OS performance on the iPhone SE, very good. In terms of app performance, this is where the beefy hardware starts to shine. Everything from playing games to watching videos on the SE was a really nice experience with, as I said, no issues with crashing. And all in all, app performance is solid for a budget iPhone. Because it's an iPhone, you're also going to be getting that legendary Apple support cycle. And seeing as this phone was released with iOS 13, it will most likely get updates until at least iOS 18, which just makes it so much better value. Next up, we got the speakers, which, like all modern iPhones, feature that stereo technology. This means that both the top and the bottom speaker are used in conjunction to create that stereo effect. The result is a louder, more immersive experience, and on the SE, I'm actually quite impressed. It doesn't sound quite as good as on the iPhone 11 in my experience, but honestly, both are totally fine for some casual listening. Again, as always, I wouldn't recommend relying on iPhone audio for anything that involves monitoring or accurate listening. I'd always recommend good speakers or headphones for that, but for simply watching videos, it does a pretty great job. Finally, we have the battery life. The iPhone SE battery comes in at 1,821 milliamp hours, which is honestly way smaller than most phones out at the moment. Certainly less than the 11 series, almost by a factor of two times when it comes to the 11. However, the small screen, more efficient processor, as well as great battery retention during standby periods, do mean that this shouldn't just be written off as bad right away. And in my testing, it would last a day. Now, this is something I'm used to with my iPhone 10. That said, I have been using my iPhone 10 for ages now, and I've only had the SE for a week. Overall, in real-world usage, I've managed just fine, but in comparison to something like the iPhone 11, totally different league. So, all in all, what do I think of this phone? Honestly, I'm actually pretty impressed. Is this the perfect phone for me? No. Is this phone aimed at me? Again, no. The iPhone SE is a well-rounded phone at an affordable cost that I think for most people will be incredible. It performs great, takes nice photos, and gives you all the bonuses of iOS for under $400. As I said before, I personally prefer to buy refurbished. Yet a better deal, the seller gets some money for their old phone and less goes to waste. However, a lot of people don't want a used phone, which does make sense. I mean, there are a lot of advantages to having a new phone. And due to the new phone market being so expensive right now, I think the iPhone SE might just be the the best value phone on the market. In fact, I think this might be the best value iPhone ever made. All right, guys, so that's it for today. As always, thank you for watching. Remember to like the video if you want to see more content like this and smash that subscribe button. I'm done for now, and I will see you guys in the next one.